Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our DEI podcast. Uh, we're here uh, with some important guests to give some information and education about gender affirming care. And uh, this is part of our educational CME series uh, with our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, program. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jody Bonmiller, and then we have psychiatry resident, Dr. Ote, and we have Dr. Saloon, our family medicine intern. And uh, we are going to have a little discussion about some different topics, uh, but first I want to invite Dr. Bonmiller to give a little bit um, of information about what she does in regards to gender care. I've started a gender clinic a couple years ago. Um, a colleague asked me if I would be interested in doing gender care. So I didn't know what it was. I had to go look and find out what is gender care. And I realized that it's transgender care, providing gender affirming hormone therapy to transgender folks. And then my next question was, well, how do I train myself how to do this? I didn't get any experience in residency. I didn't get any experience in medical school. So how do I train myself to take good care of transgender folks? So I ran across WPATH, which is World Professional Association of Transgender Health, and that's where I got my training from. And before I could even put an advertisement in or say anything about treating transgender folks, all of a sudden they just started showing up in my clinic. And I was like, hmm. so then I reached out to find out where did you find me? How did you find me? So apparently a behavioral health specialist out in the community discovered that I was WPATH trained and I was providing gender affirming hormone therapy. So she came to me and started referring patients to me. So that's how I got into gender-affirming hormone therapy. Awesome. So that's pretty um, important because I think the majority of us didn't have a lot of training in medical school and in residency. So uh, having that available from medical students and residents now is very important. And for us, uh, we need to you know, try to find those same resources yeah. so we can be educated and can help them as they try to find some of these answers. Exactly. Since you two went to residency quite a few years prior, or I mean after, <laughs> Dr. David and I, did you all get any experience to transgender care in medical school or LGBTQ care at all? I will say um, where I trained, we got some experience with what we would refer to as uh, specialized case cases. So maybe patients that were HIV positive, or having difficult conversations, but not necessarily dealing with gender identity or transgender issues, really. Okay. Did you, Dr. Salem? Um, Yeah, I actually did get a few different electives throughout my fourth year, and then uh, I sought it out as well during medical school. So early on, they would bring in um, the uh, LGBTQ population, also having some HIV uh, patients, and would do like panels. Um, we had the opportunity to go to a trans uh, healthcare conference uh, my first and second year. And then my fourth year, we had a month long rotation where it was focused on LGBTQ plus healthcare, where we had the opportunity to go to like prep based clinics as well as trans based healthcare clinics. Sounds like the younger generation is getting more exposure than what you and I got. Oh, 100%. But well, that's good. Um, we definitely need that. Um, so, so you didn't have much in your medical school, but uh, what has your experience been so far during residency? Um, so we have trans patients that come in through Laura Wood, so I've worked with them quite a bit, but my first real deep dive working with transgender patients was at your gender clinic. <laughs> and that very first day. That was so much fun. Love that. <laughs> What about you, Dr. Saloon? What has your experience been with transgender folks in residency? In residency. Um, so my first day with transgender patients specifically was actually yesterday at your gender clinic um, where I got to spend an afternoon uh, working alongside you and seeing a lot of your um, patients who are just seeking trans-affirming uh, care. Um, overall, it was a great day. Uh, would definitely like to be invited back to your clinic uh, and spending some more time there. It uh, fostered a great sense of uh, patient phys patient physician uh, relationships, and you would just see how grateful they were to have uh, 
gender affirming clinic that yeah. is easily accessible. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds great. It sounds like your clinic is offering a lot of services uh, that's needed by that community. Uh, tell me what you think some of the more important things that you look for in a healthcare in that population in terms of just uh, basic screening and so forth. So with the transgender folks, um, a lot of people do have, as you had mentioned, depression, anxiety from all the stressors that they've gone through growing up. So one of the important things that I really want to do is work closely with psychiatry, behavioral health specialists, so that I can make sure that they're good, well-rounded. Um, and, you know, the gender-affirming hormone therapy, that can do so much for a person, but there's also other ways that people can transition. Um, I'm sure you two have noticed you can do like social transition. So, you know, your social transition is changing your hairstyle. You can change the way you dress and, you know, change socially. You can change your pronouns, change your preferred names. And I'm sure you saw that in the gender clinic as well. And I walk in and I always say, hi, my name is Dr. Bon Miller. My pronouns are she, her. How about you? How did you two feel doing that, walking in and asking pronouns? How how was that for you? It was definitely um, a little bit unusual at first, just because it's not something we ordinarily do. Um, but after doing it a couple times, it became natural. And in fact, I kind of carried it with me. So Good. at Laura Wood or my other rotations, I introduced myself. I'm like, hello, I'm Dr. Ote. My pronouns are he, him, but I also go by she, her. What are your pronouns if you have any that you prefer? So it's second nature now. Good. Glad to hear that. How about you? Um, in the clinical setting, uh, like you said, I tend to not do it for most patients. Um, yesterday, I did it with every single patient. Um, so I walked in. I was like, hi, I'm Dr. Saloon. Pronounce he, they. Gave a little spill about myself just because um, those patients are used to seeing you. Uh, so I wanted to try to make them feel comfortable. Um, and after doing it for one day, I think whenever I get a new patient or I'm seeing a patient for a first time, I think it's a great way to let them know who I am, give them a short little uh, blurb about where I'm from and whatnot, so that way they feel more comfortable and are able to talk to me about any of their medical issues. Yeah, that's great. I think it's something that's pretty simple to do. It sounds like once you you know do it and you get accustomed, it's kind of second nature. And I think it's important not just to uh, do that in that setting where you're at a gender clinic, but you may be in the hospital and you don't know. And by doing that, you may have someone that say, hey, these are my pronouns. And you may open uh, an avenue or just help create that relationship with the patient that you may not have otherwise. So that's a simple thing that can be very effective. It does. It opens up a door. So if somebody comes into a clinic just to see you for, I don't know, high blood pressure or something, and you walk in and you use your pronouns, that can open up a whole new world and you can get a lot more information. You know, how can I better serve this patient now that I know they're transgender? Because mm -hmm. when you'd ask about screenings with transgender, you have to know what parts, what anatomical parts a patient has so you know what screenings to do. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Um you know, mammogram. You wouldn't think about a mammogram, but you got to kind of think backwards a little bit. So if you have a transgender male patient, if they're on estrogen therapy and spironolactone, they're going to develop breasts, which is what they want. So once they hit the age 40, 45, whichever, you know, you, you, USPSTF or ACOG or whatever guidelines you're using for screening mammograms, once they hit 40 or 45 or 50, if they've been at an estrogen for five years, they need a screening mammogram. When you tell them that, you should see the look on their face. They go, I get a screening mammogram. <laughs> I'm not sure there's many people that have been happy to get them. <laughs> and that's why gender medicine is so good, because people want to come see you. They're excited to get their mammograms. They're excited to get their medicines. I mean, blood pressure, how many people are 100%? compliant with their blood pressure medicine? How many people want to take their diabetes medications versus gender clinic and their gender affirming hormone therapy? They want to take their medicine. They're 100% compliant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's impressive. Yeah, I really wish we could get that across the board. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's like a dream, but it won't happen. Um, but that's pretty excellent. 
All right. Uh, anything else well, you want to touch on? Piggybacking off of you, the screening uh, yesterday during uh, the gender clinic with you, I was asking about trans men and testosterone and ASCVD scores. Uh, if we should transition to indicating uh, sex as male at that point, since their testosterone is within uh, male levels. I think we came to the conclusion that in that case, we would consider switching to males and then uh, deciding if appropriate statin therapy is indicated at that point. So I know through med school, I always remembered, okay, anatomy is important for screenings. But then being in the actual gender clinic and uh, seeing all the other health issues that come along with just being alive um, and functioning in the U.S., that one came up pretty quickly. Yep. Yep. And then um, the transgender men, you know, you got to, again, think about what parts they have. They still have a cervix, so... It's hard to get them to do a pap smear, but it's important to get them to do a pap smear or at least HPV testing. So screenings are important. Colonoscopy is the same universal, whether you're assigned male at birth, assigned female at birth, transgender. Colonoscopy is a colonoscopy. Right. But, yeah. So it's a great thing is that we have access here to that, but that's not universal. Uh, what are some of the health disparities that you worry about in the um, gender community, especially where they may not be able to have health services that are appropriate for them? I think the biggest concern I have with the transgender population, if they don't have access to any health care, is actually psychiatry, psychology, behavioral health specialty. Because I think that is probably the most needed. If they don't have access to any gender-affirming care, I would hope that they have access to behavioral health. Right. Just kind of going a little bit back towards the screening, because of the fact um, a lot of these patients, that demographic, they often have like comorbid anxiety, depression, as you mentioned, oftentimes PTSD, depending on what their social situation is at school or with their family. So screening in that aspect as well. So making sure that they have that psychiatric or a therapeutic follow up as well is also equally important. Yeah. Excellent. So we have... Here, we know some of the things we have to look out for for screening, some of the things we have to look out for um, when care is not available. Um, what do you think some of the barriers are to have care available for everyone, um, including obviously that gender community? I think it's the stigma and the discrimination that the population is afraid to. They're afraid to go see a physician, whether it's psychiatry, family medicine, they're afraid to go because people in the lobby don't look like them, they don't dress like them, and they're they're intimidated and afraid of discrimination. You two find that, or what do you think? I would definitely agree. Um, I I find, uh, at least with trans people I know socially, um, if you find a doctor that you are comfortable with, you will try to go to that doctor for everything, even if you need specialized care, just because you're actually comfortable at that point. So in uh, a lot of places, they'll get like hormone, hormonal therapy either through like an OBGYN or like endocrinologist, and then they will choose not to go to a primary care physician and just try to get everything done through that one office. Um, and I believe it's also so the same way if you find your primary care physician that is offering that health care, you rely on them to refer you to someone you can trust or you ignore them because you don't want to go somewhere else. Um, and that's aside from cost and everything else that goes along with the healthcare system. Agreed. I also think it's just kind of finding what resources are even available. I believe on the that first day when I worked with you in the gender clinic, one of the patients had mentioned, you know, before you opened your gender clinic and they lived quite far away, like in Athens, they had to go all the way to Atlanta to get any sort of care. So just the lack of people that even are willing to work with this patient demographic, just for whatever reason. Drew? So how do you think we can remove some of the barriers, uh, the stigma, uh, those issues, not being able to 
find someone that you're comfortable with. Um, is there anything that you think of from like a grassroots level or even for a, from a system level that may be beneficial? Well, my go-to is always representation matters. Um, it's one thing to provide the care, uh, do the care, but if no one sees you actually doing it, it doesn't spread as fast. Um, I find the LGBTQ community is pretty close-knit, so word of mouth works well, but for people coming of age and uh, finding their gender identity outside of the internet, um, being able to just see it within your community or seeing that there's a pride flag or some kind of uh, same-sex couple advertisement within the clinic uh, can make a big impact. It can. just I just have a little rainbow on my badge that opens up a lot of doors. Um, I think educating staff from the, um, oh my gosh, what's the word I'm looking for, y'all? I don't want to say janitor. I don't want to say housekeeping. What is environment? environmental services. services? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. You know, educating people from environmental services on up to us, the physicians, about using pronouns, about being open, being inclusive, and being affirming. That makes a big difference and just education of the whole system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, um, for example, on the psychiatry side, we had that joint presentation that we gave to the first years uh, last year, which I actually repeated again in January of this year. So we're continuing to educate and, you know, um, also some of those changes that you've made or volleyed for, is that the word? Campaign for in the That's epic system. Word. Yes. I yes. think if you wanted to talk about some of those, because I think those are amazing. Yeah. So within epic... If y'all ever see where it says the gender marker on somebody in the storyboard, if there's an eye with a circle around it, it would be good for you to go ahead and click on that button. That will let you know what pronouns they use. And that really helps make the patients feel comfortable. So that helps break down barriers right there, mm -hmm. too. So Epic did add that, and I was very happy when they did that. Oh, that's awesome. Now, that's something I'm learning of for the first time. Uh, is that something that's been uh, widely uh, disseminated, um, do you know? I keep telling people about it. Um, there is a education series coming out, I want to say April 1st, to educate all of us. And that is mentioned, the eye with okay. the circle is mentioned in that. Awesome. So I think that's part of what you look for when you say system-wide uh, coming from a higher level. And that's part of the mission, you know. NGHS, NGHS wants to um, wants to improve the healthcare of the community and everything that it does. And you know that community is part of the overall community. So I think um, those types of things are important uh, to make it easier for everyone um, to play their part in in taking care of that community. 